Welcome to our Big Blend radio show here with Mike Guardia, who's a military historian and author of numerous books. He talks about Julia Compton more today. And so today's show is on his Big Blend radio military Monday show with Mike Guardia channel on our Way Back When History channel and on our brand new Women Making History channel. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Welcome to Big Blend Radio's Military Monday Show with Mike Guardia, award-winning author and historian. Welcome, everybody. You know it is March, and March is a Women's History Month, and so today we're going to be talking about a very special lady, Julia Moore. Julia Compton Moore, actually, is her first name. And Julia was born in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, back on February 10th, 1929. We're going to be talking about her, her relationship with her husband, Hal Moore, and the legacy and uh, work that she did for women uh, who were married to uh, men that served in various wars. So we're going to, of course, have Mike Guardia here. Mike, how are you? Hey, Lisa, I'm doing very well. Always a pleasure to be on the show. Hey, we're excited. You know, we do this show with you every first Monday of the month. And so March, I was like, dude, we got to do something on Julia Compton more. Um, and so, you know, I didn't realize in, you know, I got to let me just back up here, uh, everyone. Uh, Mike has written a couple of books, three books, right? Um, mm-hmm. Focusing on Hal Moore. So we're going to start with the uh, biography, Hal Moore, A Soldier Once and Always, and that chronicles the life of L- Lieutenant General Harold G. Moore. And then, uh, you know, the, the movie, We Were Soldiers, that uh, starred Mel Gibson. That's kind of, is that how you knew about Hal Moore? Uh, yeah, you know, the uh, the first introduction that I had to Hal and Julie um, w- was that 2002 film that came out I, uh, I i had the privilege to see it on opening night and uh yeah i had heard in passing about the battle of i drang but i uh, never got in depth into any of uh any of the key players both on the battlefield and also on the home front and uh you know just seeing that film and uh, just the incredible impact that hal and julie had as a military couple uh really inspired me to want to learn more about the both of them and uh yeah it was just a uh it's been a fascinating ride ever since. Um, and we got to go to his museum, um, mm-hmm. which was amazing because I remember Nancy going, we're on Helmore Parkway in Bardstown, uh, Kentucky. Yeah. You got to call Mike now. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, pull over, <laughs> go to the museum. You know, it was just one of those things where, oh, yeah, we're here. We didn't even like dawn on us until we were literally in front of the museum. Yeah. Um, but you've got three books. So the other one is Helmore on Leadership. Mm-hmm. Winning when outgunned and outnumbered, um, and this is a book that you wrote with him, right? And then also took his principles and do speaking engagements, right? And it's yes, uh, it was a finalist um, in the 2018 International Book Awards. Mm-hmm. It sure uh, was. Do you still do those those talks? I know you teach, uh, but do you still go out and talk about leadership through Hal Moore's work? Uh, not. As much as I used to, um, I really, I really just let the book do its own talking. Um, you know, I know that it's been, it's been included in, in several leadership courses. Uh, it's become, uh, it's become a regular book that's, uh, that's part of the course texts in leadership courses at both the Air Force Academy and West Point. And I know that it's been, uh, it's been featured on a number of blogs. It was featured on Jocko Willink's, uh, podcast. Um, so I think the, uh, I think the book as a, a, as part of an ongoing leadership seminar, um, for any number of venues, you know, that, that have hosted it, yeah, I, I think that, uh, I think that really drives home a lot of the, a lot of the big main points. Uh, the last, uh, the last speaking engagement that I did for it was, I just want to say it was about a year and a half ago now. And it was mm. at the, it was at the headquarters of the seventh infantry division at, at Fort Lewis, and oh, uh, Fort Lewis. Yeah. and yeah, that, that is uh, that is that is uh, by every strand the the big target audience for the book, and those who I think really stand the most to benefit from it because uh, much of it was written from the warfighter's perspective. So you've got the leadership, yeah, the warfighter, right? And that that yeah. I think is 
I'm going to get into the third book too. And then your latest yeah. book, uh, Fire in the Hole, that's kicking butt on Amazon, right? Um, you're, yeah. you're like a bestseller with it right now in Vietnam War history, right? Which is pretty big. I think that's pretty big because it's, you know, like you, you're telling the stories from, again, the fighters position, the actual people, the combat heroes, right? People on the ground, the combat engineers. And I think Hal Moore was like that. Look, he really cared about the people beyond the uniform. And right. He really did. did. He, he really yeah. did. You know, and, and that was uh, that was really one of the things that spurned me on to write the book Fire in the Hole. You know, I wanted to uh, I wanted to put something out there that was told from the soldier's eye view. And, uh, you know, those who were pretty much the who were pretty much at ground zero, your your um, your Johnny on the spot trigger pullers who were mm-hmm. really making things happen, because, I mean, without them, you don't have uh, you know, you don't have a war effort at the ground level mm. and also, you know, to tell it from the perspective of a, uh, of a uh, branch of um, combat arms that really doesn't get, I think as much press as it normally does or as it normally should. And one of the last times we talked about um, Hal Moore was when Fort Benning became Fort Moore. And mm-hmm. we're going to talk about Hal Moore's wife, but, She's actually part of the name Fort Moore. It's it's for Hal Moore and her, right? Yes. Wow, that's cool. How often does that happen? Well, yeah, it's uh, it's you know what I, I think this that's the first time that anyone has proactively named a spouse as part of the legacy behind the namesake. And I can say with uh, you know, I mean, I can say with every bit of sincerity that uh, that they as a couple earned it because. Mm-hmm. So much of what Julie Moore did as a military spouse really paved the way for a lot of the army program or a lot of the army family programs that we have today. Mm-hmm. And I don't think uh, the army's family network would be a shadow of what it is today without a lot of the uh, a lot of the legwork that Julie Moore put in, you know, um, 40 and 50 years ago. Let's back up a little bit. You've got the three books. The third one is how more. And you look at his life and pictures, right? Uh, a life right. and pictures. You have photos. And did you get yeah. a lot of that from his family? And from, I did. From him? I did. I did a lot of uh, a lot of the initial photos that I uh, that I got um, were when I was uh, interviewing Hal Moore for the first biography. Uh, you know, I pretty much had unrestricted access to uh, his entire photo archive there, and mm-hmm. I was uh, scanning um, scanning a lot of pictures of what would eventually go into the biography. And as I was compiling a lot of those photos and trying to figure out which ones would go into the book and, you know, also leaving it to the publisher's discretion of which ones would make the final cut. uh, At some point down the line, I I got an idea. This was right after I, this is right after I finished the leadership book. I said to myself, you know what, there's probably a market and there's probably, I, I would say a need to, continue the story in terms of a photographic essay because they say a picture is worth a thousand words where there are so many so many great photo ops and so many great um, images that have been captured um, by Hal Moore and his family over the years that uh, not just illustrate the depth of his military career and his commitment and his accomplishments but also just give very valuable insight into the man himself and uh mm-hmm. you know what what made Hal Moore tick, what his values were, what his what his core driving principles were. And mm-hmm. I said, you know, if I could put this into a photo album of sorts, just a uh, a published life in pictures, you know, kind of a uh, you know, it, it, it's comparable to a coffee table book, but not quite. I said, I think mm-hmm. that it would, uh, you know, I think it would resonate with, uh, it would resonate a lot with um, those who are inspired by how more just like I am. And I, I, yeah, that's huge. I, because yeah. I look at it this way that, you know, Nancy and I travel the country doing parks, public lands, and also a lot of museums. Uh-huh. And museums now, you've got to think about how we now have been documenting history for centuries, right? right. And so museums are, at this point where things have to be digitized and remember back when in microfiche days, you know, Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've, you've had to do that, right. Your research. (laughs) Yeah. 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 You know, good old microfilm. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And so there's this, but at the same time, a museum 
only has so much space to showcase. And, you yeah. know, sometimes it's a special, like, here's how Moore's life would be like a rotating exhibit kind of thing. Right. And I think what you've done is make it very accessible to people around the world by putting it in a book, you know, so people can get the, you know, the paperback or hard copy or also digitally. And mm-hmm. I think that's something we need to look at in regards to history is that the books are our next museum and it's something we can access all the time, you know, whether it's from our phone or tablet or, you know, the actual physical book, physical books are always better personally, but um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) don't you feel that like that in a way that you kind of, it's a museum piece. I do. Yeah. Yeah. And and it, uh, and I think on a subconscious level, that's also what motivated me to present it in the way that I did. You know, I said, hey, uh, there's there's any number of good museums you can go to that are going to have exhibits like this. And uh, if you go to the one in Bardstown, especially, it's a, uh, mm-hmm. it's a virtual treasure trove of, of things that um, celebrate Bardstown's favorite son, so to speak. And it, it, yeah. it, uh, I, I just wanted... It, I wanted to make it accessible for all of those out there who would never get a chance to see that museum or might not otherwise have a chance to, yeah. uh, you know, learn as much about the man. And in a broader sense, it's really what motivated me to do those books on the F-14 and the F-15. Because, really? Uh, yeah, uh, because, you know, I I went looking for a one-stop combat history of the F-14 and I couldn't find one. You know, there were several fragmented volumes out there and a lot of the... Uh, a lot of the most comprehensive books out there on the subject were long since out of print, uh, published by publishers who had long since gone out of business. And, uh, you know, they were fetching like $250, $300 on uh, Amazon or eBay just because those editions are that rare. And wow. I'm like, well, you know, I, I don't want any aviation enthusiast or, and and veteran like myself who wants to get access to this to be uh, put out and only, you know, get fragmented parts of the information. And usually at, uh, you know, at, at these, at, at, at these cutthroat prices. Right. And so I'm like, okay, well I can write a book myself on it, you know, uh, compiling everything that uh, I've learned, uh, you know, any, uh, any, any existing interviews that are out there. And that's, uh, th- that really was the genesis for the books on the F-14, F-15, and especially the MiG-25, since it's very hard to find, um, you know, any comprehensive published book out there that's not, you know, upwards of like $500 or whatnot. Right. Because don't you also, if you've served and you've been in air- aircraft or used certain artillery ammunition um, or have even been to certain camps or bases, right, or mm-hmm. fought in certain regions, don't you want that connection later or even during? You want some kind of <clears throat> connection to the history of the right. then, so you can connect it to the now in a way, of course. you know? Yeah. And I, I think I, I love those books. I had no clue, you know, Nancy and I had no clue, like, you know, <laughs> Hey, I got these books. We're like, all right, we're going to talk about fighter jets, but Holy cow, you talked about the people in them. You talked, I did no idea about these jets being sold to this country. And the next thing you know, it lands back here again, like this full circle moment. And um, mm-hmm. now I'm just, it, it is, opened our eyes, you know, and, and minds. Um, and, and here we are, you know, women who've never been in the military. We're not, you know, um, we're not Julia Moore by a long shot, you know, now she's a woman married to Hal Moore. And, um, I want to get into her story so, so much because she, you talk about these couples, like these military couples, right? There's Mm -hmm. a strength, um, they say always, behind, you know, behind every great man is a great woman. I hear any Lennox, any Lennox singing in the back of my head. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, they really were a power couple, but it wasn't, I hate that term, actually, power okay. couple, because it's so, um, I just don't, I don't think they would like it, actually, <laughs> in my own mind. It's, it's like a, um, I think they cared. You know, power, mm-hmm. sometimes the word power Maybe it's just right now the political climate power just sounds so gross right mm. now. Um, you know, instead of, yeah, care. I, I feel like they cared. He cared about the soldiers. Mm. He not only led, but fought side by side with. 
and rescued. Mm -hmm. She was in a way in a, a different war with the wives of wondering what was happening to their husbands, keeping morale up, raising families during all of this in during Vietnam, right? Did their legacy start in Korea or Vietnam? Like where do we should, yeah, it, it really did start in Korea, the Korean war, right? With him. I, I want to kind of back up where they first met and what they went through together, their beginnings. Yeah. So their beginnings actually started a little bit before the Korean war. Uh, if we wind the clocks back to 1948, so this is going to be right when Hal Moore comes back to the United States from his duty in occupied Japan. So uh, he spends the uh, first three years of his uh, of his time on active duty with the Army of Occupation in Hokkaido, Japan. Um, you know, uh, learns as much as he can about the Japanese culture. You know, he's he's there on occupation duty, very proud paratrooper. And it's time to him. It's time for him to rotate back home. Uh, he lands at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Well, what was then called Fort Bragg. And uh, that's the home of the 82nd Airborne Division and uh, pretty much the de facto home of the Airborne Corps itself. And uh, he is at first assigned to the 82nd, but he has uh, what can only be described as a very much administrative role. Because this is, I mean, even though we're three years out from World War II, it is still very much the post-war army. There's really not a lot of training going on. And most of what he is doing is escorting the remains of dead soldiers who had been temporarily buried in Europe. And now they're being re-interned stateside to be closer to their families, um, you know, their surviving families in uh, Georgia and the Carolinas and whatnot. And so for, uh, for a, a few months, probably the better part of a year, He's doing that and he decides, well, you know what, I, 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 it's important for me to escort the remains of my falling comrades, but it's taken a little bit of a toll on my, you know, on my psyche. I, 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 I want to do a little bit more than just be a, uh, well, be, and I'm not even sure that this is the right term, but it's mm. the only one that I can think of right now. It doesn't want to be a Johnny on the spot funeral director or right. a a hearse tender, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And just because he, he, after a while, it, it, it does weigh on your soul. And so he, uh, uh, so one day by chance, he comes across this advertisement that is soliciting volunteers for an experimental parachute program. Uh, the uh, the Army Field Forces has this uh, has this testing and evaluating program where they're testing experimental parachutes for the Army, Air Force, and the CIA, and uh, sure. the include the these include a number of both low altitude and high altitude insertions, and uh, he says, "Wow, okay, that really sounds like a blast. I think I want to do that." And while he is in the midst of uh, this, um, while he's in the midst of this. Uh, um, airborne evaluation section that's when by chance he he comes across the young julia compton mm. uh, was at a uh, it was at one of the local pools either on fort bragg itself or in the greater fayetteville area and uh they pretty much hit it off right away and then he learns that her father is colonel compton who is a uh, very distinguished artilleryman and who had fought in the european theater of world war ii and uh, the the uh, very strong courtship between the two of them, uh, you know, blossoms. And by the following November, that's November of 1949, they get married. And th there's a uh, <laughs> there's a very humorous anecdote that uh, is a footnote in the uh, that that is a footnote in the leadership. No, no, excuse me. It's a footnote in the Life and Pictures book. And it and it tells the story of Colonel Compton uh, supposedly locking himself down in the basement on purpose, no less, and trying to drown his sorrows with a bottle of Jack Daniels because he is uh, none too thrilled that his daughter has married an infantryman. And oh. for those who don't know, uh, there is a uh, there's a very healthy rivalry between the infantry and the artillery that uh, goes back for several centuries. 
<laughs> so uh so th- that is uh that is the popular <laughs> anecdote that is associated with that wedding but uh despite the uh uh the uh, despite the initial reluctance to have his daughter marry an infantryman and uh you know him trying to uh trying to ease the you know trying to ease the pain drown his sorrows <laughs> uh, w- with a bottle of jack uh very <laughs> quickly accepts how more as his own son and uh, the two had an amazing relationship for the rest of Colonel Compton's life. Post hangover. It's like, yeah, here, I'm walking you down the aisle with my head hanging down, right? Uh, yeah. 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 But, it, you know, but, yeah. It, but I think her childhood, because she was even born on a fort, you know, at a fort, not on a fort, uh, yeah. at, at Fort Sill in, in Oklahoma. So she she really knew and was raised. And she was a brat right you yeah. know so she really was raised in this world so if anyone's going to understand it as a wife she already had it you know and right. because as far as what i've learned over the years and reading your books mike and going to the museum seeing even helmore's house which is not far from the museum it's so um humble it's not you know i think he was that i think he never lost sight of where he his roots of who he was as a person, like from childhood to, you know, adulthood and striving for something. He kept, I don't know. He just seemed to keep his principles and integrity. I think we've used that word with him before integrity, you know? Um, And I think she had that. And then, you know, just, they kept that. They, you know, we talk power couple again, using that term, but I don't, that's why I don't feel like, they're like that i think power couple now we're looking at beyonce and jay-z or something and it's just a different picture i'm not knocking anybody at all but i'm just saying it's um it's unglamorous they were not this that's what it is that they were just really good people doing the right thing with Mm -hmm. integrity um without the glamour they weren't they didn't care about the glitz it didn't feel like i mean doesn't mean that she didn't want to get dolled up or you know he's not going to shine his medals it you know what i mean it it didn't matter about the glitz and the glamour with them mm-hmm. yeah which is nice so they get married and her life is still a brat in a way right, right. when they get married and she, she traveled the world with him really. she did she oh. really did. She she traveled the world. Uh, let's see. Gosh, uh, all over the continental U.S. and uh, then uh, to his duty station in Korea when he did his tour along the DMZ there, and uh, you know just on the various vacations that they had in a number of exotic places, um, n- not the least of which was the Taj Mahal. Um, they had been. Uh, they had been, uh, they'd been so many different places and, and mm. made friends at almost every step of the way. And and with them going around the world, let's talk about her connection with the women. Right. How she bonded with them and realized something has to be done. Let's let's talk about that role because I think even um, it was well portrayed in the movie. I think with her, it was. Um, yeah, tell everybody about what she did for women and. She got in there, you know, she and she was a mom, too, during everything, mm-hmm. you know, that's important to to note, too, that she was also a mom. Uh, but tell it tell everybody a little bit about her. Her role is what she did for women, for the spouses of the men okay. in at war. Yeah, well, it's um, it's a longstanding tradition in the army, at least uh, at least the army that I came up in. And, uh, you know, for. I think as uh, as far back as at least Vietnam or World War II, that uh, when you have a when you have someone take command of a big unit, uh, be it a well, I'll say from a company level all the way up through battalion, brigade, and even for a division, uh, whoever the commander is, their spouse is for better or for worse a partner in command, and the spouse has a great sway and a great influence over the morale of the unit, particularly in how he or she interacts with all of the other spouses. So 
it's generally understood that, let's say, in Hal Moore's case, that when a man comes to take command of an army unit, a battalion, uh, that his wife will um, become the de facto leader of all the other wives in the battalion. That's the wives of the of the company commanders. That's going to be the wives of uh, all of the lieutenants, all of the uh, NCOs, and even all the way down to and including some of the lower enlisted who might also be married. And that really becomes a support network in and of itself where, you know, they form a lot of babysitting co-ops. They, uh, they do a lot of, uh, they do a lot of what are called family, uh, family events. They do a lot of fundraisers. They do a lot of cookouts. They do a lot of bake sales. Uh, really they are what keeps the home front mm-hmm. together whenever the soldiers are either out in the field or whether they're on deployment. So having a good spouse who makes good inroads with all of the other officer spouses and the enlisted spouses really does go a long way. And it can make or break the morale of any unit, uh, particularly in a time of war. And what Julie Moore did uh, was just head and shoulders, I think, beyond what most military wives were doing at the time. And uh, she really... She really played that forward into a lot of the uh, support mechanisms that Army families have today. So what she did is she gathered up all the wives and she said, OK, well, I'm Julie Moore. This is who I am. I'd like to know a little bit about you and you know what we can do mm-hmm. to help her out. Where can we find the best deals on clothes? What can we do to get to the PX? How can we help each other out? What, what are our what are our comparative schedules so we can, uh, you know, watch after each other's children or, you know, get together mm. for a ladies night out or whatever, or how can, you know, how can we organize birthday parties? It was really a mom's network that had a very good spirit of uh, keeping things same, sane on the home front. Now where she went above and beyond really was, you know, when all of the, uh, when all of the soldiers deployed, uh, you know, she, uh, she really took it upon herself to uh, keep all of the women uh, very uh, in a very tight knit uh, organization to where they had constant contact, constant communication with each mm-hmm. other. Uh, you know, she could recall instantly birthdays, anniversaries, everything else like that. And, you know, really trying to comfort a lot of the women who were having to make do without their husbands there and uh, become a uh, become a source of uh, intense emotional support when she now had war widows in her midst. And, you know, the, the way that she fought for them and the way that she advocated for them uh, was uh, was just nothing short of miraculous and really nothing uh, short of uh, nothing short, in my opinion, of warranting sainthood. Because, you know, when the casualty list started growing, the army didn't have enough chaplains and casualty assistance teams to go out and uh, support all these war widows. So they were delivering the death notice telegrams via yellow cab. Uh, So she, yeah. So she said, that's unacceptable. Tell the cab company, give me the telegrams. I will deliver them personally. And I will, I I will render all the support that I need to for them. And uh, then, you know, she would just raise hell with any number of the base commanders, any number of congressional leaders, even when she didn't think that army families were getting a fair shake at something. And when she uh, was, when she was with um, how, when he took command of Fort Ord out in California, uh, you know, she helped lay the foundations for what there are, for what would eventually become the army readiness program. And, uh, you know, she would have, she, uh, you know, organized it so that there was a one-stop for all of the families to, uh, you know, exchange, exchange, you know, things like baby goods, to exchange information wow. on child care and uh, really just made uh, the army post itself a support network for army families. And in doing that, she really laid the foundations for, uh, you know, the army readiness, uh, the army family readiness system that we know and love today. Uh, every single unit has one and it, uh, it runs deep within the, uh, it really runs deep within the roots of the organization that, uh, you know, that know that if you're a soldier and you're here, that you have, you know, and even if you're a single soldier without a family, you have a network that is here to uh, emotionally support you. It, it 
I think this is something that we all need to understand what a military family goes through. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I know from when we lived in 29 Palms, what, you know, the other side of the family was going through, especially at that time, you yeah. know, yeah. It, Desert Storm, you know, all mm-hmm. of that, you know, there were so many tours, like, wouldn't that happen with, you know, <clears throat> a soldier going back out, coming back home for like, here, here, you get to do laundry after five years <laughs> kind of thing. And then, oh, now you're gone again. Like it was it was really difficult on the families. And I think she understood that, right? And so was she a help for women who had no clue about the military system? I I was thinking about that with her, how, you know, it was great for her and Hal because they spoke the same language, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think, well, she was really ingrained in it. I think even more than him in in her childhood, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, for maybe a, a young lady marrying a soldier, not having a clue about the military, what a whirlwind is it for them? Suddenly your life has changed. You may be going international. It's just a different protocol even. Right. I mean, you know, you, you, you're you on our shows all the time teaching. Nancy and I, well, no, this is not how it is, girls. You know, kind of thing. So for for new wives, and new husbands now too in in this era um if you're not familiar with how the military works it's got to be kind of a like a shock in a way it, like a it, like a culture shock in a way you know when you go to a new country that's always a culture shock you go through that mm-hmm. and i think going in being in the military lifestyle suddenly can be a little difficult oh yeah yeah so I think she did a lot for women that way, right? Yeah, she did. In helping them. It uh it, it it was it was really it was really a godsend for a lot of those women because uh you know you had some of these uh you had some of these spouses who they were with their young officer or their young enlisted husbands and it really was the first tour for that spouse. And they didn't quite know what to expect and then almost as soon as they arrived at Fort Benning now they're suddenly whisked away uh, to fight in Vietnam, a uh, war that isn't isn't it, it's not terribly unpopular yet, but the mission parameters are ill defined, and uh, it, it's not going to go as smoothly as a lot of people think it is. Uh, so you know, just uh, just that big unknown and trying to grapple with the realities of military life, it, it helps to know that you have someone you can talk to and someone who is coming from the latter day perspective of a military spouse who say, you know, hey, once upon a time I was in your shoes, I was a clueless spouse, um, you know, didn't really know uh, what to expect or which way was up or what the army's expectations were even, and so you have an advocate here for me. Oh, and by the way know that uh, I'm here to address any um, emotional emotional support needs that you might have. Mm, that's really huge. I mean, when you think about it too, like if someone goes through an illness, you know, and uh, you can't, you, you want somebody who's going through it or has been through it right. to communicate with because they can tell you something straight up or make it mm-hmm. funny or not. You know what I mean? Versus someone who hasn't been there, <laughs> you know, then it, it, the other the person who has not been there doesn't know how to communicate. It's kind of the same thing. I'm not saying military is an illness, but it's it's a serious life thing. It's a life change, you know, and it's a commitment for the whole family and the kids. So mm-hmm. was she able to help with the kids, too, with, through this and help the moms, you know, in that family unit, help the kids understand what their lifestyle was like oh, as course. brats, too. Yeah, yeah because- she had five children of her own <laughs> and yeah, uh, that's yeah, a lot and, of kids. Yeah. Dang. And, uh, and at least one of those children fell within the range of age groups that uh, all of the other kids were. So it's like, Oh, Hey, well, you know, uh, I have my son, Greg, and here's my uh, other son, Steve, and here's little Davy and here's Cecile and here's little Julie. And uh, they can, yeah, they can play with your kids and they can show them the ropes and, you know, tell them, uh, tell them anything and everything about uh you know about uh um what it's like to be an army brat including you know where the best places to hang out on post yeah 
Okay, so on post, that's something too, right? For mm-hmm. people to think about, it's like the military has its own city, yeah. right? So that's the other thing. So how does that work, actually, just for us civilians to know? Because some, like when we were in 29 Palms, there were families living off base and there were people living on base and then there was military housing. How does yeah. that all divide up? What, who, who gets what and where and why? Uh- Okay. Well, um, typically, uh, if you are a service member and you are assigned to any one post, depending on what the post policies are, you're almost guaranteed to be eligible for on-base housing. Um, So by way of example, I can tell you this. I can tell you when I was at Fort Knox, uh, if you were a single officer, male or female, unmarried, and you wanted on post housing, they had a spot for you. So uh, there were, uh, now if you were a single officer, or uh, okay, so if you were a single enlisted, uh, you would live in what are called the barracks. And uh, single enlisted barracks go from private E1 all the way up to uh, about a staff sergeant E6. Um, so if you fall into one of those uh, junior enlisted categories, you live in the barracks, which are pretty much like your modern day apartment buildings. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they have all of the typical amenities that you would see there. You know, it's a, uh, you know, it, it can be like a 10 by 20 studio, or it could be like a, uh, it, it could be like a small one bedroom uh, suite or whatnot. But those are you, but those are comparable to your modern day apartment complexes. Now those are termed barracks. Okay. Now if you are a single officer, male or female, between the uh, ranks of second lieutenant to about a captain or major, uh, you can live in what's called the bachelor officer quarters. And depending on the post, that can either be a much bigger apartment complex or it can be. Uh, uh, single unit housing that are comparable to townhomes. They're pretty much all connected. Yeah. Uh, you have provisions for that. And, uh, and if you are a single officer above the grade of major, you know, up to, you know, up to and including Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel General, uh, you have single unit housing that's standalone housing uh, that's on base housing, and uh, and that's what the command billets are typically typically identified as. You know, you'll have like a battalion commander. Even if the battalion commander is not married, he's going to get his own standalone house. And it could be a one story, it could be a two story, uh, anywhere from fifteen hundred to to about twenty five hundred square feet. And if you're the command, if you're the post commander you're generally going to live on a special part of the base that's called commander's row. And it's going to be all the nicest houses that are on that base. Mm. Um, You know, typically it's period architecture. And then the base commander is going to have this, (laughs) is going to have this uh, uh, very nice house that could pretty much be a mansion unto itself. Uh, Typically anywhere from 3,500 to 4,000 square feet. And uh, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be, Easily yeah. the nicest house on post. It's going to, you know, be identified by the flags in the front, the flag that has the uh, number of stars according to the flag officer's rank. Like if he's a three star general, it's going to have three stars on it. Uh, so those, that's your on base housing. Now, and you and you don't get drunk as a soldier and go knock on his door in the middle of right. the night. <laughs> yeah, don't because, do that. Then you're going to meet the pavement real fast. <laughs> okay, yeah. you don't do that, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so that, so those are the options for on base housing. Now, you also have the option to live off post if you want to. And if you do that, uh, the Army will give you what's called BAH. Um, it, it's it's called Basic Allowance for Housing. And depending on where you live, um, each state and each metro region has its own assigned number for Basic Allowance for Housing. So let's say that I was a soldier and I wanted to live not on Fort Bliss, but I wanted to live out in the economy on El Paso. And I would fill out a form that says, hi, my name is Lieutenant so-and-so or Captain so-and-so, and and I want to uh, live off post and I need a, and I need, 
a basic allowance for housing in order to cover that. So that would be money that's thrown onto my regular annual salary as a soldier. And because I've been identified as living in the El Paso area, the Department of Defense calculates, okay, what's the average rent or average property tax for homes in the El Paso area? And they say, okay, congratulations, Lieutenant so-and-so. Uh, in addition to your monthly pay, you will get an additional $1,200 every month that you can use to offset the cost of housing, whether you want to buy a home that you're paying property taxes on or whether or not you want to rent a mm-hmm. home. Uh, so, uh, and whatever. And if you go above that, that's your, your right. deal. You yeah. have to pay for that. Mm-hmm. So how much did Tom Cruise pay for that house in Top Gun in Oceanside, California? <laughs> I'm just <laughs> kidding. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, but that's the truth, right? So because the military can do, yeah, you can do that. So like if you have a wife who's a, I'm not living on base, that's it, right? right. Then you can appease doing like, okay, we're going to go out here. Yeah. So they work with you. Do they work with you internationally? Because I was thinking about that with Julia and, uh, you know, Julia Moore, keeping her in mind of, of this conversation, you know, during, you know, Vietnam and everything, where were they living at that time? And if, you know, because they traveled the, the world, literally, right? And in mm-hmm. Asia, and I know so many military families, and a lot of times they'll say, oh, we were on base or off base. And I always wondered about that. I was like, well, how did you do that? <laughs> you know, but it can happen that way internationally, right? As they were living, you know. Yeah, yeah. So um, now in today's army, even if a unit deploys overseas, all the family that's home and they're living on the base, they get to stay on the base. Now, uh, back in back in the mid '60s, at Fort Benning, anyway, um, if if the if the unit deployed overseas, the spouses had to vacate the on post housing, which was just so incredibly dumb wow. <laughs> you know so i was like what are was you kidding army? me yeah 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 so that 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 was that was just infuriating um but uh now uh, now in, in uh, on the overseas posting like i mean you know like some of the overseas bases that we have in germany and also in south korea uh yeah it's a little bit different of uh, a standard there because Typically, what you have is you have these uh, small little um, bases that are networked together. So most of the families who end up in Germany or the ones who end up in Korea, they they uh, they live on the economy anyway. Uh, You know, they'll like they'll they'll take, uh, you know, they'll rent, um, you know, these homes in the German countryside or, you know, they'll rent the uh, second floor of a German apartment or whatever. And, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the BAH that they get to live is calculated, um, according to whatever the local currency is and, you know, the market trends of, you know, what the typical rates are. Just wild when you think about this, you know, yeah. about being kicked off base. Like, what if you have, ki- you know, that's kind of weird. So it did is. Julia, did Julia go through any of that where she had to move because. Oh, of course. Yep. Wow. And- and it did not matter that uh, she was a colonel's wife. It didn't matter that, you know, her husband was a battalion commander. No, nope, the only thing that mattered was that, uh, okay, the unit's overseas. So you ladies, you all got to clear out of these homes. And you know, a lot of them moved into these bungalows and these trailer parks out in, uh, you know, out in, uh, out in the town outside of Fort Benning, Columbus. <laughs> And, uh, you know, they, they were just living in these. This sports. is in Georgia. Yeah. This is Georgia, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Cl- Columbus, Georgia. Yeah. I've been there. Yeah. yeah wow. It, it's, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's incredible. And, you know, for lack of a Did- better term, it, it really was just infuriating because they were living in these squalid conditions. Yeah. And, and insult to injury, you know, you have a, you have a yellow cab that's going to deliver this casualty, uh, this casualty notification. You're just like, you know, it's like we're already down. Do you really want to kick us while we're down? Right, right. And did substance abuse happen to these women? Uh, Do you think through it? I wonder about that. Well, you know, if it did, and I'm I'm almost dead certain that it did. Um, If it did, I didn't hear about it. But I'm Mm -hmm. sure that a lot of these women, because, well, a lot of these women were already smokers. I mean, this was the early 60s. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I think a lot of them took to more tobacco use and, uh, you know, certainly it's not beyond the realm of possibility that, uh, you know, they would also, they also uh, turn to alcohol to ease the pain. Yeah. Um, illicit drugs. I don't know if those were truly a thing within the ranks yet. Yeah. But you fast forward just, you know, five more years to get to the end of the 1960s and, Yeah, all, all of these uh, illegal substances are run rampant through the barracks. So I'm sure that in some form or fashion, they made itself into the military families. It's wild, man. When you think about it, like, so this is, I'm so glad we're having this conversation because I don't think we get to hear the other side of the story, yeah. what the women go through, you know. Um, Julia Compton, didn't she get a, a, an award um, for her work for... Um, the army families. Um, she, I think it's the Julia yeah. Compton Moore award I'm reading about. Um, it's through the Ben Franklin global forum. Oh no, that's the press release, but she got like an important um, award for what she did. Yeah. 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 She did. She, um, well, she was awarded. And then now there's an award that, that also carries her namesake. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Just for, you know, for, as important as being a military spouse is, uh, it really does warrant a reward for those who do an exceptional job in keeping those in, in, in keeping all those all those army families together. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they uh, they say, and this is this is more than uh, you know this is more than just an amusing um, uh, anecdote. They say that being a military spouse is actually the toughest job in the military. And based on everything I've seen with my own two eyes, everything I've read, yeah, I can tell you that that is 110% true. I mean, yes, wow. uh, the people in uniform do a uh, do an incredible job. I know that we veterans, we can all look back and say, yeah, I mean, it was a it was a tough line of work to be in. It was tough, but it was rewarding. But uh, at the same time, we have to say, you know, it. Uh, it is an incredible drain for those who have to hold down the home front. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And as a matter of fact, one of my fellow veterans was telling me not too long ago said, you know, Mike, I look back on our time in the service and I actually think it's a lifestyle that's better spent alone. Mm-hmm. And all things considered, I really couldn't argue that point. I mm-hmm. really. Couldn't because I, I, what, yeah. yeah. I, I had a friend um, who served and, in Camp Pendleton and he, he went through a lot and, um, and, and, and through, um, Desert Storm and everything. And he was in our, our band, our music band. And, um, we went to his house on Camp Pendleton and they had a really nice house. Mike, he said he was a gun sergeant, but he had a really nice house in Camp Pendleton. So I don't know what that mm-hmm. means, but, um, his wife, lost it pretty much so much stress so much strain and Mm -hmm. he i don't really know like we always said he was the cia like we always joked about him because he he would disappear and then come back and it was i mean when you were talking about the housing i'm like i don't think eddie was a gun sergeant i think he was way 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 more and um he traveled the world and very, very intelligent human being, very kind soul, amazing human, just amazing. I miss him. And, um, but I remember we went to, uh, his, I think it was his 40th or 50th birthday party at his house. 40th. Yeah. He wasn't. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Now I'm really feeling old. Um, but yeah, it was his 40th and it was bad. Stuff went down and it was a very emotional evening and his wife was not handling things very well and having a very hard time because she also was, it was a battle between her being her own person too, you know, um, and not speaking ill of anybody here. It was a very traumatic, tumultuous time. And, and I don't think our band should have been there at that event, but it was a, party for him and he had just gone through back surgery and next thing you know he was on the ground and it was a very very traumatic night and I know he's fine with me talking about this it was um when I realized that 
the women are suffering and yeah. people would look down on her. You know, people didn't understand her, but like she was in pain, like emotionally in pain because her husband was there and then not there. You know what I mean? Um, and I don't know what he was really doing in the military. I don't to this day. And I always think there's something more about him. Um, mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, you, I can't even explain it, but do gun sergeants have really fancy houses on Camp Pendleton? <laughs> well, let's see. He's a gunnery sergeant that makes him an E7. He he would be, yeah, he, he would have housing comparable to, I think, a captain. Um, so if he's a married, uh, a married sergeant with dependents, yeah, that uh, that would that would he'd okay. be in, yeah, he'd be in housing comparable to a captain. Yeah. Okay, but yeah, she she was having a hard time, and I wonder about where we are now from where what Julia started, how we are now in women supporting women. Maybe it just it it was she was having a hard time because her husband wasn't home, and then he would go off and do music and do things that he cared about too. Didn't mean he didn't care about his family, but. I think she 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 wanted her husband, you know what I mean? And he wasn't that he he had many interests, let's put it that way, not not in women or anything, but in that way. And it was just a very um eye-opening place to be to understand what women go through raising kids on their own and she felt very alone. And um it is sad. It was really sad. And, and I wonder about that for women on bases and maybe not understanding what they're getting into. Like what you were saying, like not, not understanding. It was a glimpse of a night of one thing that happened, you know, for them. And it was a glimpse. And I, I think that sometimes women don't know what they're getting into, you know, or men marrying into a, a military family situation. Like, how your life is going to change, right? Wouldn't wouldn't you say for for people getting into it? It's it's a it's a it's 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 going to be more than just your life, right? Yeah. As a couple, and for the kids that come too, and, and but there's a lot of um, lessons that are positive too, right? For everybody involved, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. For kids, they learn they learn discipline and there's some positive, you know, and I think she, I think Julia did a lot um, to soften those blows, you know, and um, yeah, I wish Eddie's wife had that a little bit more of a um, support, you know, and I, I don't know where, where to go with that. Are there women, are, are there support groups depending? I mean, so that was, Oceanside, so that Camp Pendleton's Marines, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So are there groups within the military now? Like I know she, you know, Julia Compton did it for Army Wives, but are there like spouse support groups on bases throughout, no matter whether it's, you know, Army or Marines, Navy? Well, um, yeah, I mean, there's a uh, there's a comparable family readiness organization uh, throughout each each branch of the armed forces, and uh, yeah, they're they're uh, and yeah, they all have pretty much an identical mission, yeah, you know, to mm -hmm. provide as much support for the families and the spouses as they can, and mm -hmm. apart from that. Uh, you know, you also have a, uh, you know, you also have a very long-standing, um, long-standing network of private organizations, private charities that exist for the very function of uh, stepping in, uh, where any number of the family readiness groups are are, are unable to, and mm. yeah, it just it makes for a, uh, and <laughs> most of those organizations were started by former military spouses, so. Mm. Oh yeah. See, they understand that that's mm -hmm. going back to someone who's done that walk that road, you know? Yeah. Going back to Julia Moore again. Um, she was in the movie. Um, and so we want to talk about that. We were soldiers. She was uh, portrayed by Madeline Stowe. Madeline Stowe mm -hmm. is, she's amazing. Actor, she by is. the way, I think she's great. 
Um, and she did an awesome job in that because she's got that serious face too, right? Serious mm-hmm. and kind and don't mess with her strong, yeah. you know, a strong woman and, um, and dignified too, very dignified and graceful. Like she showed you could be a graceful, strong woman, you know, and you could wear a dress and still be strong, <laughs> you know? And I think there's something to that, honestly, because, you know, even just, even in my era of growing up, it was like, if you, you, you had to wear pants or whatever to be strong, mm-hmm. you know, but that's not true. And I think Julia Moore showed that too, as, as a woman. Um, but I saw in the museum in Bardstown that she was part of the movie, like she, her and Hal, right. They kind of, were, did they like walk them through it and were like consultants on, on the film? Yeah. Yeah, they were. So how, how especially, uh, yeah, he served as a technical advisor on the film. He was, uh, you know, on location for so much of the filming and, you know, just provided his inputs wherever he could to make sure that it was as accurate of a representation as he could provide. And, you know, as one, you know, one that, uh, one that adequately reflected the realities of life in that unit. Mm. Okay, so she's part of that. So everyone, mm. you've got to watch the movie, but also read the books. But I didn't realize that that Helmore died on her birthday, right? He did. That's weird. Yeah. I mean, like, not weird, but, you know, like, synchronicity-wise. like Yeah, it's cosmically yeah. Yeah. Well, Well, yeah, you, you put it better than, you're the writer, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know. But it's to me that just kind of goes like those two were were like soulmates. It feels like, you know, you meet couples that you know that those two are always going to be together. I feel that about them. You know, I've never met him. You got to meet her, right? Uh, No, actually, Julie passed away before I could meet her. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Would you have liked to have met her, right? I would. Goodness, I, I most certainly would have. Yeah. I know it would be just so like, okay, I'll just sit here and be quiet. You know, <laughs> tell me, you know, tell me how to be, you know, cause she just seems like this pillar of strength and, and just such a strong soul. So, I mean, him passing away on her birthday. Yeah. That's kind of a, do you think they were soulmates? Oh yeah. Yeah. There yeah. is no doubt in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. I think they give hope to people. You know, mm-hmm. and, and as a team, and I think they represented um, team a team. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's a good word. It's a power couple, team, power mm-hmm. team. Yeah, I like it. Well, thank you for giving us some insight into Julia Compton Moore, everyone. Uh, you've got to go get Mike's books and learn more about Hal Moore. I know you've got Julia in the photo book, right? You've got her in there. Oh, I do. In, in the books. Mm-hmm. You've got, you couldn't write about Hal Moore without her in everything, right? You know. Right. Yeah. Um, but right now, the latest book uh, from Mike is Fire in the Hole, Tales of Combat with the 1st Engineer Battalion in Vietnam. So how many books of Vietnam and the Korean War have you written? Like how many? You're in the 20s now with your books, right? Every time oh, I'm yeah. wrong. So, <laughs> But like you've done a lot on Vietnam and, and you think about it in the Korean War. And yeah, you've done a lot. You kind of know that war, don't you? <laughs> like. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, how many books do you think when you think about it of all the generals? Uh, huh. Just, yeah. Just of the, yeah, the, the, just of the Vietnam. Yeah. Right? That's insane. Like when I think about it, you've done so much of, yeah. I mean, you've got a lot because you touch on so many, like even when you get into, you know, the different, you know, fighter jets and everything, you'll touch on things. So it's, mm-hmm. yeah, you've covered it quite a bit. What's next? for for you you know now that fire in the hole is a bestseller like you need to outdo yourself again (laughs) well (laughs) well you know i i have quite a few uh irons in the fire but uh one of them that i'll share is uh one about the spy war in bosnia back in the mid 90s and uh i think that'll uh Mm. i think i think the book buying audience uh will be pleased with that one yeah at least i hope they will Oh, they will. They will. Well, thank you so much, Mike. Everyone, MikeGuardia.com is the website. He is on the show every first Monday. It's our Military Monday show. We love it. Uh, Mike always teaches Nancy and I, and I know our audience enjoys him. Um, He always teaches us something new, gives us things to think about, and also an appreciation for 
military life and those who serve. So thank you so much, Mike. All righty. Thank you. Always, uh, always a pleasure to be on the show. Thank you for listening to Big Blend Radio's Military Monday show featuring Mike Guardia, award-winning author and historian. Keep up with Mike and his books at MikeGuardia.com. Follow us at BigBlendRadio.com.